everyone. Uh, today with us we have a renowned professor, Professor Srinivasan Keshav. Uh, he has been uh, awarded the uh, Distinguished Alumni Award of IIT Delhi uh, in 2019. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. And good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, so, sir, uh, first of all, I would like to know that uh, how does it feel to be back after almost 33 years of graduation and receiving a, a Distinguished Alumni Award here at IIT Delhi? So, the good news is this is not my first visit back. I've been coming back uh, many times, actually. Uh, I was a visiting professor here in 93. Yeah. And then subsequently, I visited. Every time I come to Delhi, I always visit IIT. I think I've never not visited IIT when I visit Delhi. So, but uh, but it always feels good, you know. It always feels to me, in some way, a sense of, you know, coming back to a place that I've uh, really loved. And uh, yeah, it, it, there are a lot of memories, you know, and uh, I, I sometimes I feel like a ghost, you know, walking through the town halls because I don't see what's in front of me, I see what was there. Yeah. Uh, but it, and I'm sure you'll feel the same, you know, 35 years from now. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so going through your journey. Yes. So uh, you graduated from IIT Delhi. Yes. Then uh, you had your PhD from University of California. That's right. Uh, then uh, you were a visiting faculty back at IIT Delhi. Yes. And also at the University of Columbia. Uh, yes, I was, so not all at the same time. So yeah, I, yeah, yeah. but once in a while, yes, continue. Yeah. Yeah, and then you moved to uh, University of uh, Waterloo. Yes. And presently, you are being you have been appointed as the Robert Sampson Professor of CSE at uh, University of Cambridge. That's correct. So uh, you have been traveling a lot yes. from India to you know USA, then Canada, and yes. now UK. Yes. So you have work with different professors from different cultures. Yes. You have uh, ex gained experience teaching different students of different cultures. Yes. So, how is research in different countries different from it, what it was in India? I see. What it was or what it is? What it is, actually. Sorry. What it is and what it was. So, I would say that uh, to a great extent, all these countries and all the research is roughly the same. Uh, in in all the cases, you know, what research is about is trying to learn something about the unknown. And so what we do is we look at a problem and then we, what do we formulate a problem. We formulate something that we can solve. We cannot solve everything. So we break off a small piece and then we work at it. In the old days, it used to be that uh, you know, countries in the West would have access to journals and to conferences and to um, experiences that were inaccessible to researchers in India. And so the quality of work here would necessarily be uh, not bad, but it would be old. You know, you would be solving a problem that other people here had already been solved. But that's not the case anymore. Uh, I was just talking to a professor uh, in computer science and he said, you know, with archive and with online journals, essentially all the knowledge that is out there is accessible the day it's being published, right? And so, yes, uh, you don't meet people every day that you might meet up with. But even in Essex Waterloo, for example, it's a small town in the middle of Canada. It's not a major hub. So if you want to go meet people, you know, they, you have to go travel somewhere. So it's not, in fact, I would say being at Delhi is probably better than being at Waterloo. More people visit Delhi than Waterloo. So, uh, but, the, but the task of science, the task of research uh, is very much the same in different parts of the world and um, uh, and you know the the other thing I'll say the last thing I should say is that at its heart science is meritocratic mm -hmm. it is your, what you look like and where you come from and what your accent is and what your skin color is are secondary to your thoughts and your vision and your work right? so uh, I've worked with students from pretty much every country and you know, colleagues from every country and the superficial differences don't even register. It's, we don't even care, you know, it's like a... So, uh, sir, from teaching students uh, at different regions, you used uh, uh, taught students in India. Yes. In Waterloo, and now you'll be teaching them in Cambridge. Yes. So, do you have uh, experience, do you have seen the different administration or education department of different countries? Yes. So. What is the major difference between the Indian education system and the education system abroad? And what are the major points that should be implemented in Indian education system? Okay, first of all, we should realize that IIT education system is not the Indian education system. The IIT education system was very 
uh, carefully copied from MIT, uh, you know, because that was considered to be the model for the world. And so uh, I would hardly characterize the IIT system as being quote unquote engine education system. That's certainly not true. Um, that's the reason why IIT students, when they do go to graduate studies abroad, for example, find it very, very easy because uh, it's the same system. You know, we, we actually already have a, have a, a you know, sort of American system, so to speak. So the first thing about IIT education is that it is very deep in the subject. So students end up doing, at least in my days, we used to do a total of, uh, let's see, it was 42 courses. I think you had to do 40 or 42 courses, probably the same now, and of which we were allowed to do only five that were humanities, and all the hmm. remaining 35 were science, technology, and mathematics, right? It's pretty much science. Same, yeah. yeah, same now. So, uh, so this has some advantages and some disadvantages. So the advantage is that when you go and do graduate school, you'll find that you know three times as much as any other graduate student in your area. Because the graduate students, for example, at Cornell, you can do as few as three computer science courses in the core, plus a couple of optionals, and you get a computer science degree. So the core is very narrow. The same thing at Waterloo. I think the total number of... Waterloo is more intensive than Cornell in terms of computer science courses, but I think they do perhaps... I'm trying to remember maybe... 10, 10 or 12, I don't know the exact number, it's in that vicinity, whereas here you're doing close to maybe 25 or 30. So the knowledge level in terms of computer science for IIT graduates is actually significantly greater than almost anywhere else. Uh, on the other hand, the lack of exposure to humanities is also a big negative for the IIT system. So when I went to graduate school, I knew way more than my colleagues, uh, stu my fellow students, I should say, in terms of computer science, but anyway, way less than there about other things. And uh, so I think that's a distinction that we, that we uh, have. Uh, I would say that it may not be a bad idea to de-emphasize the, the education in terms of you know, science and technology. Maybe it's having 35 courses and only five humanities, maybe you should make it eight or 10 humanities courses. I think that would be uh, uh, a welcome change. That's true. So, sir, uh you have been uh, in the field of research for a long, long time. Yes. But uh, midway, you also had co-founded a company. Yes. Right. And you have also worked uh, as a, you know, you have also had a job. Yes, as a research lab. Yeah, yeah research exactly. Lab. Yeah. Uh, and you have also been a part of, you know, so sort of entrepreneurship. Yes, yes. So, having explored all the fields, you yes. came back to research. Yes. So, what was that motivation that you, that always kept you in the research in area? research area. So, uh, I mean, each person has gains their, you know, satisfaction from different things. For me, there is that one moment in research where you see this idea that's so beautiful and you know that the only person in the world who knows it. And when you have that moment, it's like a drug. <laughs> and once you have, I, t I tell it to my students in class, I said, every once in a while, you know, if you're very good, it comes once every few years. If you're very, you know, if you're not normal, it happens once or twice in your lifetime. Uh, but you have this idea and you see this thing, it is so clear and so obvious that it's the right thing. And you look around and you say, how come nobody else can see it? And then you explain it to them and say, oh my gosh, you're right. You know, that is the right thing. And that experience is uh, really uh, quite amazing. And I've been fortunate I've had it more than once in my lifetime. But um, so that is what keeps me going. And then the second thing is at some level, I view research as being research for a purpose. You know, I feel that uh, researchers and professors are, uh, uh, in some sense, we are funded by society, by tax mm -hmm. on society, and they give us this tremendous uh, freedom. They say, you do what you want. We trust that you will do some, something useful. We trust you do something that's relevant to society who's after all funding you. So I feel that at some level it is a, a obligation of researchers to uh, think a little bit more about what is this research for, you know, who will benefit if I succeed. So I tell my students, okay, this is your problem, now you're successful, I just grant you you're successful. Now what changed in the world? Did it become better, did it become worse, or did it become better? When you ask that question, you immediately start seeing what role you can play and that has always been the motivation in my work. And so. Uh, 
so this you know second answer to your question is that research is uh, being able to do research is essentially a, a, a gift to be able to uh, help people really in a, in a way that is not immediately obvious but it has very long term long term consequences so yeah so okay so uh, my next question would be uh, in the system that we have been observing right now most of the students after graduation they try to pursue either a job yeah. or they have a dream of being an entrepreneur yes the indian education system is not that much focused on research yes uh, but you obviously opted for research yes so how much do you think is research important to uh, to the development of a country should the research be more focused on in the institutes like iit or the trend which is going on of jobs and being an entrepreneur should be uh, should we should let it uh, be right so i think that uh, at some level what the student what students want to do after they graduate is the students decision right it is their individual responsibility it is their individual uh, uh, you know wish where they want to go and i would not be somebody who is going to uh, uh, you know force anything on anybody uh i don't agree that students don't go into research perhaps 1 in 10 maybe 1 in 20 goes into research right as opposed to most people who go into uh, uh entrepreneurship or you know into a research or to some job in some in some multinational for example um but that's normal right being a researcher is a very weird and unnatural existence <laughs> it's not for everybody we don't want everybody to do research it would be crazy we, we the research is uh, is something that only a few people are crazy enough to do because it's full of uncertainty it's, you think doing a startup is uncertain being a researcher is even more uncertain <laughs> you don't even know for the many times what it is you're studying it's only after you do it you say oh that's what i was actually doing all this time and so uh, it takes a tremendous amount of um, i would say it's not confidence but being comfortable with uncertainty that don't feel that the fraction of people who are doing research is too low or something like that uh, in fact i would say that the fraction of iit students who do research is certainly uh, more than normal for uh, equivalent in institutions yeah uh, uh, last question from sure. my side yeah sir uh, another thing that i have noticed about you is that you don't use mobile phones yes <laughs> how do you know this yeah, i i uh, asked my one of my colleagues yeah, yeah, who has yeah. been with you yeah, for, yeah that's uh, right yeah day. so uh, in this generation where everything is on the internet over the mobile how do you do that i have one big advantage over you which is that i grew up without a mobile phone <laughs> so i know Uh, how to live without one, and it's quite easy. You just don't use one. <laughs> so, actually, I don't have mobile phone now. I, I, I have a voice phone, but I left it in my room and I forgot to bring it because anyway, nobody's going to call me. So that's not going to. So I, you know, the big, the very simple re- answer is this, right? I don't do anything important in my life. I don't. Everything I do is kind of not very important on the short time scale. So. This is, I don't. I'm not a surgeon. I'm not really taking care of anything so important and urgent that I need to be reached. I'm mostly useless. So it doesn't matter if the people can reach me or not. If they want to reach me, they can reach me on my email, and I can reply to them. Even there, uh, I don't have any email that is so urgent that I have to reply. So I have a very boring life, and essentially useless life. and uh, to me the most valuable thing uh, not the most valuable thing one of the valuable thing in terms of my thinking is to be able to think about something for a long time and to think deeply about it and i used to have a smartphone i had a blackberry phone for 2005 to 2009 and for two years i owned the phone the next two years it owned me and so i was pretty much addicted to it and i realized you know this is not very good and so uh, I have not used a mobile phone or a smartphone since 2009 so October 2000 almost exactly 10 years ago I stopped using it and uh, very recently because I moved to Cambridge and I wanted my wife to be able to reach me I got a uh, like a voice phone uh, it's a feature phone <laughs> and I can charge it once every week and still works but uh, I have never been in a situation where I needed a phone actually uh, because Uh, I'm surrounded by people who have phones, 
And if I really desperately need a phone, let's ask somebody and they're very happy. They first mm. look at me and say, poor man, he hasn't <laughs> had a phone. He has been something wrong with him. And then I say, okay, okay, you can use my phone. It's okay. <laughs> I, I really do think that uh, these technologies of connectivity and of mobiles are addictive by design. They are designed for addiction by the device vendors. And while they provide uh, many useful functions and features, you know, maps and alerts to various conditions, and you want to go somewhere and so on, I, uh, you can take pictures and so on. Uh, it is also true that uh, they uh, have taken a position in our mind of, of, uh, of distraction. So I call them weapons of mass distraction. <laughs> And uh, so I prefer not to be that way. And I'm lucky that I'm in a job that permits me to not need one. And uh, most people cannot, you know, don't have a useless job like mine. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, it was pretty interesting to talk to you and right. it was much insightful as well in terms of research fields of yours. Sure. Uh, so thanks, yeah, thanks a lot for yeah. your time. Yeah, thank you. Great. You're welcome. Okay.